We are going to try to finish with uh, Inferno today, and I would like to look at the uh, last cantos, 30, 31, 32, maybe a little bit, 33 for sure, and there's a couple of details in 34. Um, from one point of view, um, I'll be talking about Dante's tragic mode at the bottom of hell. This is, I hope to, to argue with you that I will be arguing exactly this is uh, uh, a tragic representation. And as soon as I say that, you might wonder, you probably should wonder, uh, uh, but I, the, the difficulty of such an enterprise. Uh, and the difficulty of the enterprise is to do, first of all, with the fact that this is a comedy, so that difficulty should go away in the sense that um, the tragic is really part, not an end, not a, 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 a final vision, but part of a larger discourse that Dante will, will go into, which is a comical idea. He really has this idea of a comical, um, a comical vision of, uh, or even the divinity uh, and, and certainly of the cosmos, comical in the sense that it's really the feast, the feast of, uh, of uh, uh, the, the f in classical times would be the feast of the gods. Here is the, the redemptive, happy, harmonious sense of, a, of the whole. That's one of the difficulties. The other difficulty uh, that about this uh, mode uh, of uh, the tragic uh, is that the, the, um, within the Christian vision that Dante, uh, that sort of shapes Dante's poem, uh, it's very difficult to locate the tragic. Uh, there is no such a thing as a, a, a Christian tragedy. Though one might say, and I will say here, just to sort of, of uh, uh, give you a sense of how, how uh, nuanced the issue may be, is that within that vision, within that Christian vision, uh, we are always told that the only thing we know of God's presence in history is the crucifixion. It's the story of the dying God, of the story of the suffering of the divinity itself. It is not, once again, a final vision, so there is a theological problem that he has to confront, and there is also an aesthetic problem, a larger aesthetic problem. Um, so to really clarify this issue, rather than just telling you all this comes from, uh, I, will, I will look at these cantos from one point of view, the point of view of Dante's writing a particular text, a text about language. So it's really going to be about language and, and tragedy in the belief that this is exactly Dante's insight about what, what the tragic may be. So let me tell you, I have to go a little bit outside of the text for a while so that when I point out details here that we'll talk about another text, you will see what I mean. You know, and this is a sort of uh, uh, also a little bit of a recapitulation for you, you know that Dante goes into exile in 1302. By that time, he had written only one book, a autobiographical book, that had he, the Vita Nuova, the, the, the new life, that uh, had he written only that book, he would still be known as one of the great poets of the Middle Ages. But he would not really be known for more than that. It's a little bit of a self-enclosure, a lyrical poem, uh, self-enclosed. It's about, as you recall, um, a kind of uh, sense that the self is absolute, that love is an absolute itself, that does not allow for the intrusion of anything within its own orbit and its perimeter. And Dante finishes, finishes off, finishes it off, finishes it off with a vision, realizing that he has to do other things in order to go on writing. He just doesn't write much at that point. He may be writing some songs, he is involved in political life, in the footsteps of his teacher, Brunetto Latini, uh, and hoping that his life will really be very different from Brunetto Latini. Ironically, it is not, because actually it's even more tragic than Brunetto Latini's life, because Brunetto Latini uh, is politically involved in the history 
of, of, of Florence. He will experience exile, but he will return to Florence, enough to even go on teaching Dante. Uh, he has written encyclopedic uh, texts like Tresor, has written allegories, autobiographical allegories about his life. Dante will go into exile in 1302. And the first thing that he writes is a treatise on language, which you know, which is called as On the Vulgar Tongue. It's a text that uh, written from the perspective of exile, very much like the Divine Comedy, because as I repeat, Dante will never go back to Florence. The reasons why he writes this kind of, uh, of, 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 of text, it's written in Latin. Uh, the reasons are very unclear also because he never finishes it. I'm going to suggest to you that there are good reasons why he could never finish it. Uh, but he wrote two books. We don't even know how many he had conceived of uh, writing. What is this text about? So let me give you a little bit of a, of, of, of a summary of the text, and then you'll see how it will go on um, um, uh, reappearing in, uh, in, uh, in Dante's uh, poem, uh, the, the, the final cantos. Of, uh, of Inferno, where in effect he rewrites, he writes, and gives a whole, a sense of the wholeness of this text and the difficulties of, and he will share with us his sense of the difficulties why that tract could never have been finished. At any rate, it starts, it's, it's called the De Vulgari Roquentes, it deals with the, uh, the origin of the vulgar tongues. He starts very much like uh, medieval treatises start with, uh, uh, from metaphysical standpoints, from the very high, uh, where does human language do? Is language something absolutely human? And the answer that he gives is yes and no. It is human because we are the only, one, the only ones who do speak. Though he, he, he makes room for animals also, occasionally speaking in a human voice uh, and being understood by human beings, making sounds that are, that, and he's not talking about parrots, he's talking about miraculous biblical scenes. Uh, but he starts by saying, the angels do not speak. They don't use the language we do. They communicate, Lucifer, for instance, he communicates, but he communicates uh, with the other angels or with God intuitively. It's a kind of, so there's a reality that escapes the human, the human language, the language that we use. There are some things happening that we do not have. And then the language is that it's only human, and yet it's not human because it's actually a gift. We couldn't really make it on our own. It's really God's gift. This is the metaphysical premise. Who was the first, who are the first people to speak? It goes on Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That's you know, biblical enough. I think it's uh, fairly clear. What was the first language that they spoke? Hebrew. Hebrew is acknowledged as the primal language. And he will even go on so far as to say that Hebrew has never really extinguished by, for instance, either the fall of man, of mankind, or uh, by the building of the Tower of Babel and the whole question of uh, Nimrod. Here's a whole story about who this Nimrod is, the famous biblical giant who built the Tower of uh, of Babel, uh, and which, a, 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 an act which he, he, even he, Dante, but this is very much like in the tradition of uh, the so-called patristic writings, will see as the counter to the descent of the word. You know, the redemptive event of uh, the word made flesh is really the counter to this human effort, this, uh, this ascent in pride of Nimrod to try to bridge the gap between earth and, 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 and heaven, uh, 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 and it's an effort that fails. So he will go on acknowledging uh, Hebrew, but I must say, uh, not only he says that uh, it survives the story of Nimrod, he says it has never really disappeared. He takes, and I'm only qualifying it, what we would call a, an, a, an ahistorical viewpoint. You know, he does, he, it is almost as if Hebrew is accepted from does not belong to the flow of history and the reality of the mutations but to which all things, all sublunary things are prone and are vulnerable. The Hebrew is accepted from it. I stress this fact because I'm going to go back to this maybe toward the end of the term when we're going to read uh, Paradiso 26 where Dante meets Adam and they are blatantly he changes his mind. It is as if something has intervened in between the writing of the De Vulgare Eloquentia and the encounter with Adam. When Adam says, look, uh, the Hebrew language I spoke completely vanished uh, as soon as I ate 
of uh, the, the, the fruit, of uh, the forbidden fruit of the tree. So Dante goes on and says that there's no trace of the original language. That's to say, in paradise, Dante is ready to historicize the question of uh, human language, okay? But not in this treatise of the Vulgari Eloquence. He goes on um, uh, uh, describing uh, um, uh, the, 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 the descent of the word, so it's a theology of language, and then book one ends and he moves on to book two. And in book two, Dante gives a completely different, takes a different direction in this treatise. He starts talking not about the grammar of language, what we could call the grammar of language, that is to say uh, the ordering, how this language was ordered, that's what I mean by grammar. Of course it's a word that explains letters, correct uses of things, but also the ordering of a certain reality. He talks now about rhetoric. And he becomes almost a theorist of poetry and style. Poetry and style. He goes on explaining, uh, for instance, he goes on wondering uh, what are the, the three styles of writing poetry. And uh, you know, because I've been mentioning some of them, you may recall the high style, the medium style, the middle style, and the low style, the style of comedy, the style of tragedy and the style of the elegy, the, the middle style, elegiac style. Uh, and he even suggests that style should never really be thought of as a pure ornamentation, as some of us, maybe we do, whatever we think about style, so and so has style. You know, we all remember the phrase that the style is the man, right, the character. Uh, uh, but sometimes we say, well, that guy writes with style, meaning that he has brio, he has a particular uh, gift in, uh, uh, in, in putting, uh, pulling together words and writing sentences. But Dante sort of implies that style is really a mode of knowledge. In the measure in which he says that there is a high style for high reality and the middle style for the middle reality, the mixed world, the elegiac world, and then a low style for the comical world, he really says that if you really want to understand those who are far below, the fishermen, for instance, or uh, the clowns, you cannot really give them the, the treat them with the, ap the, the decorum with which you treat the kings. So kings speak differently, with sublime kind of language. You see what I'm saying? So there is an idea that style becomes an instrument of knowledge. He goes on describing uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, the theory of, um, uh, of the song, which is the, the greatest uh, uh, the greatest poetic lyrical form, and it's the song, because it's a way of bringing out the music of the language. You know, the music, uh, Dante is responding, this is a little historical detail, is responding to a poetic revolution that had taken place within, in Sicily, at the court of Frederick II, because prior to that time, the Provencal poets would be writing, composing poetry, and would uh, accompany their songs with the lute, the famous uh, Provencal poets instrument. The Sicilians had divided those two modes. It was possible to write poetry uh, in and of itself without the accompaniment of music in the persuasion that the art of poetry was the effort to bring out the inherent harmony of the language. So he talks and discusses the song, he discusses the themes, what are the great themes of poetry, and alluded to that with Bertrand de Born because Dante says that Bertrand de Born was the greatest in writing uh, war poetry. Uh, the other themes, of course, are rectitude, the rectitude of the will, uh, that is to say a sense of the ethical, what are the ethical directions that one should take, the word direction and rectitude, that really have the same, the same etymology, the, the, and then also love poems. So this is uh, the way he, he proceeds. Um, uh, and he defines poetry, by the way. He ends with a great definition of poetry, that poetry is uh, that art that combines uh, uh, music, uh, uh, the art of music uh, and rhetoric together, and he ends there. Um, it's unfinished. Uh, Dante will go on writing other things, so for instance, a philosophical text about ethics, which he also will leave unfinished, and then we'll go on writing the political text, the Monarchia, uh, etc., which he finishes. Uh, so this is the preamble to what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and I think that the best way to begin is to tell you, since I'll be talking mainly about tragedy and language, I really want to tell you how much Dante uh, retrieves of the De Vulgar Eloquentia. 
for instance, and I'm not going to be uh, really giving you a lot of details, but some so that you can be persuaded about, about this, uh, that this is really a, a deliberate pattern. This is a deliberate retrospective view that he takes of his past, of a failure of his own, of a certain way of uh, why does one fail? What is so unaccomplishable about a particular task that, uh, I'm using the words that Nimrod uses for his own Tower of Babel. He says, you know, that was an, uh, I realized that was a, a, an unaccomplishable task. And, and I find myself using those words for Dante's earlier effort in writing on the Volca tongue. But some, some, some connections between that treatise and, uh, and, and, and this lower, the cantos of lower hell. Where are we, by the way? By the way, I haven't, we haven't talked about that. I you know, talk about these are the cantos of the lower hell. We are in the general area of fraud. You remember that, right? Uh, we saw violence, now then we saw fraud. But if you, if you recall Canto 11, where the map of uh, the ethical map of Inferno had been given, Dante distinguishes between the sins of fraud and the sins of treachery. The sins of treachery is a subdivision of fraud because fraud can be. Uh, rhetoricians, falsifiers in general, uh, uh, flatterers, uh, etc. These are the. But treachery is a worse, and that, that's where we are now. We are in the realm of treachery. And treachery, the, the treacherous sinners are those who engage in a deceptive violation of the trust others place in us. This is not necessarily true for. Fraudulent people, there's a fraudulent, those people who can perpetrate a fraud on you without even knowing you or without even having anything to do with you. The question of treachery is different. It implies a violation of what Dante calls the, the, the erasure of the bonds of love, because it implies friends, family, country, hosts. Huh? I think, that, for instance, Macbeth would belong to this type of, this, the tragedy of Macbeth would belong to this type of uh, ethical judgment. Uh, so the erasure of the bonds of love and nature. Mm -hmm. uh, it is as if, as if uh, the, the, the treacherous uh, sinners are really those who, oh, in betraying, they really betray nature itself. It is as if uh, something is being said about that. They annihilate all possible uh, ties within a community, within the self and others. Treachery is uh, the, the, the language of uh, nothing. Uh, it's a way of saying that nothing matters, that no bonds, uh, there's no bond that I can, uh, that I can feel an attachment to. So it's, a, it's a, literally a severing of self in, uh, in the, the domain uh, uh, of a pure arbitrariness. I mean, that this, uh, I am above everything or I'm below everything. It doesn't matter. But I certainly have no attachments to anything around me. So that's where we are. This is so much to say where we are in the context, but the connections with uh, the De Vulgare Eloquentia. I think that even the story of Ulysses can be read in the light of the De, De Vulgare Eloquentia because it's a story of a tragic uh, style. Uh, Dante had been describing the tragic style. And, and uh, uh, the tragic style and, and, and the failure of the tragic style. Even the canto, the successive canto of Guido da Montefeltro can be, because it's, it's, it's literally the, the counterpoint, the rhetorical counterpoint to, to Ulysses. It's a story of a, the comical, the comical style. Uh, certainly Bertrand de Born is a figure who for the first time, and now the second time, appears in uh, the De Vulgare Eloquentia. Dante has a great admiration for Bertrand de Born's uh, poetic art. He says the Italians don't have uh, the language of uh, the poetry of war, but the one who has a poetry of war in modernity is Bertrand de Born. Clearly, Dante has changed his opinion here. Uh, oh, he may admire Bertrand de Born, but the, div the strife, the divisiveness that his poetry fosters now sort of has, has uh, made a victim uh, of, uh, of him. By the way, Pound writes a great poem about uh, Ezra Pound, about, about Bertrand de Born, but really keeping in mind more the Bertrand de Born or the De Vulgar Eloquentia than, uh, than the Bertrand de Born, as far as I can tell, of, uh, of Inferno. And we come to Canto 29, uh, which is, uh, which I really looked at that, that uh, so a little bit, but we come to Canto 30, for instance, 
And Dante enters deliberately now on, on the face of it. Very little, there is very little here that has to do with the, the vulgar eloquenza. But here, though, he's talking about two experiences that define the tragic mode. One is, look at this, uh, in the time, beginning from Canto 30, in the time when Juno was enraged because of Semele, uh, the, the mistress of Jupiter, against the Theban blood, as she showed once and again, Athamas turned so insane. He's, he's really talking about the tragic text, the Thebaid, uh, the tra where the gods themselves, within the world, the classical world, the gods themselves seem to have been said to be wounded by exactly the same mad passions that drive human beings to destruction. Here, this is Juno. Uh, Juno doesn't really die, but she, will, uh, she, will, uh, she suffers the same passions. So there's a, a language here of the tragic and let's call it uh, the mythopoeic. I kinda, I, it's a kind of uh, classical theology being tied together. And then the story of uh, the Trojans once again and the no fury of Thebes or Troy was ever so cruel against any etc. And then even further um, on, on uh, Canto 30 line 40 the story of Mira, uh, the young woman um, who, oh, it's, it's, it's a classical story, so it's also, it's an Ovidian story, the, the woman who is inflamed by passion, uh, incestuous passion, um, and, and, and impersonates somebody else in order to be able to sleep with her, her, her father. So there is, this is a part of all, uh, uh, of, of all this, this uh, uh, tragic, uh, let me call it tragic perimeter, but it, 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 everything focuses on this story of Sinon, I think. I like this idea of Sinon, who is an impersonator and a falsifier. Now, you don't, have, you don't really have to know a lot of Italian to know that Dante is really punning on the name. Si, non, which means yes and no. Uh, the very representation of uh, the falsification of personality. But it's, so the tragic is tied to some sense of identity. Uh, people who do not know exactly, and that's impersonation, uh, human beings who may not know who they are and who may take on some kind of uh, either figuration or the reality of somebody else. So it's, it's this idea of, uh, of, of, of an ambiguity already betrayed by, by the name. So the connection between madness and, and tragedy. And let me move on to Canto uh, 31, um, where Dante uh, enters and now meets the giants. Uh, clearly a figuration and um, an echo of the, the Vulgari Eloquentia. This, uh, uh, and one of them is Nimrod. So this is really a deliberate reflection. Let me just read a little bit of uh, this uh, uh, on line 60 and following, where he, Dante hears a uh, some kind of sounds, and every commentator of yours, mine certainly does, will tell you that uh, uh, Dante is using just uh, some gibberish. Nobody knows what it means. Uh, these are the words. Raphael, Maya Mek, Zabialmi began the savage mouth to cry, for which no sweeter psalms were fit. And my leader, towards him, this stupid soul, keep to thy horn and vent thyself with, them, uh, with that. Uh, when rage or other passion takes thee, search at thy neck, bewildered soul, and thou shalt find the strap that holds it tight. See how it lies across the great, the great chest. Then he said to me, he is his own accuser. This is Nimrod, through whose wicked device the world is not of one soul speech. Let us leave him there and not talk in vain, for every language is to him as his to others, which is known to none. We made our way, therefore, farther on, turning left and found the next a bow shot off, uh, far savager and larger, etc. He meets other, a number of other uh, giants. Um, why does Dante, first of all, mention giants, both in the De Vulgari Eloquentia and here? What is, really, what is really the point of the Vulgari Eloquentia? Uh, there is a way in which the Vulgari Eloquentia is written from the viewpoint of Nimrod. 
Because what Dante wants to do is something exactly like what Nimrod attempted. Nimrod wanted to combine all the possible languages. That's what Babel, the confusion of tongues, comes about. He wants to combine, uh, to build the tower whereby human beings can reach heaven. And I said that it's really the other side of uh, the incarnational word, the word that joins uh, heaven and earth. One is one of the scent, the other one is the pride of ascent. But uh, Nimrod wants, this is the giantism. This is, it's a, his is a sin of, not a sin, it's, it's a trait. It's a trait of, his, of knowing things. He wants to occupy a kind of superior perspective. That's what his being a giant means. A superior perspective from which he can really see the whole of the world around him and then be able to transcend the world of contingency. This is the problem with, with, with Nimrod. This is what the Tower of Babel is about. And the theological answer is that you don't do this by pride. You really ought to do it by uh, uh, humility, not by trying to go up, but really by uh, going down. What I'm really also saying, and we could talk about this, is a connection between pride and perspective. Uh, so the De Vulgare Eloquencia is also a text of perspectivism. Do you know what I mean by perspectivism? The whole, uh, what we have read so far, perspectivism simply means uh, the presence of viewpoints, various viewpoints, which one somehow manages to control. I know all viewpoints. In Dante, this is the case, the way the, the, the whole of Inferno is written. The perspective on styles. Dante uses all possible styles that I have been exemplifying for you here as we discuss the poem. He, wrote, he uses the courtly language and the courtly rhetoric of Francesca. The, the other court, the court, the, the, the legal court of, of Pierre, Pierre de Levigne, uh, the court of the, let's say, the schools with Brunetto Latini, uh, the language of the prophets. Uh, uh, he uses all perspectives. It's, it's the, whole, the whole of the Divine Comedy, such a perspective, uh, a perspectivist story. Some of you might say, well, you really are using a language that doesn't belong to Dante's own culture. That would be a very legitimate objection. Because when we talk about perspective, we usually think about this is really the revolutionary language of 15th century art. You may, some of you may be art historians here. You may know that. Um, though I could respond to you that actually there was a certain knowledge of perspective, of perspective earlier than Dante. Nonetheless, even if they did not have a theory of perspective, which I'll explain in a moment, they had the practice of perspective. In art, we usually speak of perspective in art. And we usually link it with, for instance, a figure such as uh, Alberti. You know, you know who he is, this 15th century theorist of art who wrote a treatise called On Painting, right, 1436, where he literally theorizes that which other painters from Giotto, Dante's friend, Dante's, uh, they were together in, in Padua for years when Dante was in exile and, 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 and Giotto was painting in the Scrovegni chapel right there. So you could imagine they would be meeting, they knew each other, they were contemporaries. One is a year younger than the other. Uh, Dante is a year older than Giotto actually. Uh, so they, there was a practice of perspective. What is perspective for for, for uh, Alberti, it simply means the discovery that the mode of representation practiced in the Middle Ages really lacked depth, not only that, lacked depth, and that somehow they believed that the world of appearance and the world of reality coincided. Perspective means that the world that I see shifts, changes, according to the position that I, the spectator occupy in the field of vision. I'm here and I can assure you that I see things that you sitting there cannot see and vice versa. You see things that I cannot see. So the perception of reality changes according to the position we occupy. That's perspective. Not only that, it also implies the possibility of manipulation of the space that we witness. We see a particular space. We can change it according to uh, uh, distance, according to the laws of, uh, of, of, um, 
uh, the eyes, the position of the eye according to the hour of the day. I see things which are always different. So this is perspective. And therefore, the language of Renaissance, uh, the so-called Quattrocento, the 15th century, changes the whole medieval idea of representation, where things were represented the way they appeared. And they say, that's not true. We are never going to give the sense of the, the reality of things, but the appearance of things. So that's, that's really the great the difference. Dante uses this perspectivism, which I repeat, really means a way of assembling various points of view in the persuasion that this is what really he has. He's in exile in 1302. He has been traveling all over Italy, and he thinks that he can go on forging the language, the vernacular language of Italy. He will go on, I mean, just to go back to say other things about the De Vulgari Roquenza I didn't say, he will go on writing about the proximity of the, the Romance languages. He invents this idea of Romance languages. He says that the way in which French, Provencal, Spanish, Italian are connected together, he says it's one particle, the way we use the C. Uh, or when well, he talks about the Provencal, you know, the, uh, he says, uh, uh, they are actually called to say yes, they say uh, which I guess is uh, when, they, rather, when they have to make an affirmative uh, statement. So he goes on talking about the sea, the language of the sea, the way the language of the no, this is what the families of languages are being uh, uh, built together. So Nimrod, to go back to the text, the story of Nimrod and the story of Dante seems to be strangely very close, but there's more. Look at what he does. Because it's so, the, the link with the, the Vulgari Roquenza is just extraordinary. Even this line that everybody thinks doesn't mean anything. Raphael, Mai, Almec, Zabi, Almi. If you look at it carefully, I'm really going to tell you something. It is an imperfect, there's one letter, anagram of a Hebrew line from the Psalms. And the reference to sweeter psalms next will tell you that this Dante is really giving the source. The line in the psalm, Psalm 22, is Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani. The fact that there is no exact correspondence only means that the editors have missed the point that they should amend the text. So it would be an argument for textual emendation. Well, that's something that the philologists are very careful about doing, but they always welcome possibilities. This is really, it's an amazing, so he's using Hebrew. The, because that's what he had said in the De Vulgar Eloquence, that Hebrew, though this is an inverted, twisted language by the builder of the Tower of Babel, we are not supposed to understand it, and yet behind all confusion, there is still something intelligible. That's the argument. Behind all twisted appearances of things, there, there is a residue of uh, in intellect, of intelligent, intelligible, uh, an intelligible message uh, that is going to be given. Uh, the, the, what, is, uh, what are these words, by the way? Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani, because I, I, I'm going right past it very quickly in the belief that, that, you, that everybody will know it. These are the words, Psalm 22, the, they are the words that Jesus on the cross cites, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? It's really the tragic moment, or the moment of the crucifixion, where uh, the son feels that he's completely abandoned, and that somehow the whole divine play, the whole divine uh, order, is no longer responsive to him. It's really the moment of the theological despair, let me call it, okay? And Dante, so that's, now, that, uh, and Dante's aware that if Nimrod, that's what he's, Dante, I think, is telling Nimrod obliquely, had he not been so stupid, he would have known by using this kind of language the way in which he would have been reaching heaven. You know, the, 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 the way to heaven is the way to go down into humility and not up through the building of uh, the Tower of Babel and the confusion of tongues. And then there is this whole argument here, which I'm not going to go into, uh, but uh, the, the confusion, the perceptual confusion, perspective. Dante makes, he's a far away, and he mistakes the giants for towers. Reference to this famous town that's still, if you go on the, on the, on, 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 on the highway, uh, you can still see Monte Regione, and that's, that's what Dante went by. And he thinks that the giants are towers. Uh, 
question of perspective, because in perspective you learn that you see according to the distance of the, the, your eye from the object. This is the basic mathematics, the geometry that rules and sustains the, the theory of uh, perspective. Uh, and then it, uh, uh, it will continue um, with, uh, and let me just go on to a further case of uh, this, uh, this question of, uh, of perspective. And then I want to read th in, with some care 33. Uh, let me turn to Canto 32 with more pursuing this line of references to the De Vulgare Eloquentia. Look at this, had I the harsh, let's say the beginning of the text. Would you like to read? We're reading from Canto 32, line 1, 12. Oh, I'm impressed. I didn't mean that. Uh, you go ahead. <laughs> Can, from Canto 32, line 1 to 12 in English. 1 12. Had I the harsh and grating rhymes that would be fitting for the dismal hole on which all the other rocks bear down, I would press out more completely the sap of my conception. But since I have not it, since I have not, it is not without fear I bring myself to speak. For to describe the bottom of all the universe is no enterprise to undertake in sport, or for a tongue that cries mama or ba and babo. But may those ladies aid my verse who aided Amphion to wall and theme, so that the telling may not be diverse from the fact. O oh, beyond all others misbegotten crowd who are in the place it is hard to speak of, better had you here been sheep or goats. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Okay, we have, this is a beginning that in many ways rehashes what last time I called the ineffability topos. You remember at the beginning of Canto 28, Dante there is talking about the sublime, uh, a, a sort of, uh, of parodic, uh, a sort of, of uh, inverted form of the sublime, uh, so the horror of what he was witnessing is such that he could not he could not know that he could find the metaphors for it. This is now uh, the deployment of a variant of that conceit. And the conceit here is that Dante is looking for a style. Uh, here is perspective. There must be a unique style for this particular reality. And he starts, I cannot go on using the language of familiarity. I have to use a, the babbo and mama, the language of the child. Because this is just, they are the treacherous souls who have betrayed, first of all, family. So there is, there is a sort of uh, a tragic resonance even around that little motif. This cannot be done in the ordinary familiar language of every day because these sinners have indeed betrayed all of that. No, uh, it can probably be done at all because I'm aware, and how he, could he not be in this area of treachery and fraud, that words and deeds do not necessarily belong to it. I'm only paraphrasing the text. So uh, a search for style, which he understands as a form of what is convenient, what is decorous, what is appropriate. That's the metaphor he uses. It's part of where an argument of the vulgar eloquentia, the principle of convention and convenientia in Latin, the convenience of a particular language over another when one is dealing with a particular reality. And, 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 and the further problem of what kind of style do I have? Is, there, is it, uh, can I get in order to represent this uh, kind of world here? He appeals to Amphion and the building of Thebes once again. This is a tragic story of Thebes. And obliquely, he's also appealing to something that he himself has written. Since Amphion is the poet who moves stones by the power of his language, right? A version of, of, of Orpheus who placates, tames, the, the savage beasts within the heart, within us, uh, he wants to be a kind of amphion. The fact is that he has written stony rhymes. He has written, he's moving, it's a, it's a sort of retrospective view that he takes. He's, 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 he thinks that the only kind of style adequate to this reality is the style of the crazy poems, representing a crazy time of his life for this lady of stone who change would change him into stone. We, uh, a, an allusion to this appeared in the canto of the Medusa in canto 9 
of inferno. So that, that's really, it's in, in it begins with this, uh, this search for a, uh, uh, a particular style and uh, uh, Dante will go on uh, uh, through this, uh, uh, this, this kind of, uh, this, this whole, whole world of uh, further into the frozen uh, iciness of hell. There's no fire, burning fire. Uh, and now that's how the canto ends and we start with the next canto. We had already left him, line, line 122. When I saw two frozen, two frozen in one hole, so that the one head was a hood to the other, and as bread is devoured for hunger, so you know we're approaching the most, to me, the most unbearable scene of, of, of Inferno, the cannibal cannibalization, a human being cannibalizing, literally eating the other. I know that some of you may have your sense of your taste, is can be different. To me, this is really the worst pos possible representation, tragic representation here. The one above set his teeth in the other at the place where the brain joins the nape. Tedeus gnawed the temples of Menalipus for rage, just as he was doing with the skull and the other parts. O thou, who by so bestial a token shows the hatred against him that eatest. Tell me the cause. I said, on this agreement, if thou hast reason in thy complaint against him, I, knowing who you are and what his sin, shall yet requite thee in the, um, in the world above, if this tongue I talk with be not withered. So we are approaching a moment where literally silence envelops all possible representations. It's something that nothing, not all can be altogether sayable. So it's something that can escapes the sayable and it's, it's that boundary. We are at that boundary that Dante uh, places us. So uh, this is, uh, you know where it is. I have to read this, uh, this, this exchange. I will read it in, uh, and then try to comment on it. I wish we could have a discussion about this, this canto. That sinner, uh, actually the Italian really begins, uh, that's, that's the, the, the sentence structure of the English, would allow it, begins with a mouth that occupies the primary place in the line. And the Italian is la bocca, uh, the mouth, the, sub, the object is, is, uh, uh, is, is primary here. In English, of course, the sinner lifted his mouth from the savage meal, wiping it on the hair of the head he had wasted behind, then began. Thou wilt have me renew desperate grief, which even to think of already wrings my heart before I speak of it. But if my words are to be seed, that may be fruit of infamy to the traitor, I know thou shalt see me speak and weep together. If we had time and I were to ask you whether this line reminds you of anything in particular, I'm sure my, some of you would immediately jump and tell me. These are clearly an echo of, very good, Inferno 5, Francesca's language. The language of love has become now the language of hatred. Because from the point of view of Ugorino, and that's part of his tragedy, he can't tell them apart. He does not know what love is and what hatred is. And he can exchange one for the other. And here we are. You could all even argue that retrospectively the language of love, Francesca, maybe was also the language of hatred. But you would be pushing it beyond the limits of, of believability. I think that Dante is really uh, echoing that, Francesca uh, and the love and the romance with Paolo uh, in order to explain this hatred. And that's the, the blindness of Ugolino. And I use the word um, uh, deliberately. Um, there is no, what he lacks is any perspective on himself and on the world around him. So uh, it then continues, thou art, I know, I know not who thou art, nor 
by what means thou hast come down here. But indeed, thou seems to me Florentine when I hear thee. The focus is on language. Language here, which is a part of one managing to, first of all, know the other and understand the other. They may know the inflections of the dialect, the Florentine dialect, and they may even think that indeed, and Dante has a lot to say in the De Vulgare Eloquentia about the question of uh, the dialects and the, and, and the instances, that they can communicate. In effect, there's no possible communication between the two of them. If I were to define for you the, the rhetorical genre that Dante deploys here, is that of what we call a dramatic monologue. Ugolino goes on speaking and therefore he expects, nor does he get any response from his interlocutor, his apparent interlocutor. A dramatic monologue. When he goes on telling us the story of his life the way he sees it, you know, you all know 19th century dramatic monologues in English literature, right? If uh, not me, another. This is an occurrence of that genre. I can speak, I can tell you, I can go on fictionalizing myself, and I believe that my perspective of the way I fictionalize myself will become your reality. And Dante entices, of course, Ugolino to do exactly that. Because this, this is exactly, this is the way in which you are in hell, where you go on really believing that whatever you tell, that you can go on telling stories and deceive yourself, hmm, deceive yourself that others are going to believe what you are saying. Uh, that you are, the reality that you're going on constructing is everybody's accepted reality. This is one of the issues, clearly, uh, that we, we, we are going to confront. Thou art to know that I was Count Ugolino. And this is the Archbishop Ruggeri. What an extraordinary line. And what makes this extraordinary is, first of all, the occurrence of what we call attributes, titles, and then the shift in verbal tense. Ugolino will go on uh, attributing time, I was, Count, Count Ugolino, and this is. That is to say, the object of his ha hatred is unalterable, is timeless, and that object of his hatred is exactly what goes on, defining him, right? I, time belongs to me. I know that I, 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 belong, I have a history. There is a history behind me, and, there is, and this one here, the reified object of my hatred, is unchanging, Archbishop Ruggeri. So there is a, the secular and the sacred, if you wish, welves and ghibellines with the idea that uh, Ugolino had really betrayed the side. He was, uh, a wolf became a ghibelline, and a ghibelline became a wolf, and so on. So uh, the, the, the recapitulation of all the infernal satanic sins we have seen so far. Uh, and then how, how by means of his evil, um, I shall tell thee now why I am such a neighbor to him. What another extraordinary line, because it's uh, uh, you know, the idea of what a neighbor is, right? Uh, and what, what the neighborhood has become, right? Uh, this, this is the way uh, uh, neighbors cannibalizing, uh, cannibalizing uh, one, cannibalizing the other. Um, um, how, how by means of his evil devices, confiding him I was taken and then killed, there is no need to tell. But what thou canst not have learned, that is how cruel was my death, thou shalt hear and shall know if he has done me wrong. And uh, he tells the story that he was uh, put a, a prisoner in a tower, which we are meant to under, understand all the, the languages of the other towers. A uh, tower which, which isolates him is a tower in Pisa. By the way, it's really the tower. This is, has nothing to do with this, but I, I find it is irresistible. If you read the cantos of Ezra Pound, some of the most extraordinary poetry of his, uh, I think comes from when when he was declared a traitor um, in, in, in the aftermath of the Second World War, he was put in a cage not too far from this Tower of Pisa, which is really one of the most beautiful parts. It's near the Scuola Normale in Pisa. And, uh, and he writes this poetry about the tower that he sees, clearly his own sense of trying to understand what treachery 
really means. Um, and and I, what I'm really saying is these are issues that keep uh, being present in the consciousness of, of, of some of the leading imaginative figures of, of our time. So he goes into this, the, the, um, the Tower of the Hunger, as it is called, and was shut up. I had already shown me through its slit several moons when I had the bad dream which rent for me the veil of the future. So he had dreams that uh, uh, he has a dream. And the mistake he makes is to think that the dream is going to be real. And the dream is this. This man appeared to me as a master and lord hunting the wolf and the whelps. Uh, the, the word wealth comes from wolf, uh, wolf and ghibellines, on the mountains for which the peasants cannot see Luca. With hounds lean, trained and eager, he had sent a gualandi, etc. When I awoke, so he has this idea of, of the destruction, the mutual destruction, so the wolf, etc. When I woke before morning, I heard my children who were with me crying in the sleep and asking for bread. Thou art cruel indeed if thou grievest not now, thinking what my heart foreboded. And if thou weep not, at what dost thou ever weep? So they were now awake, and they, are, they were now awake, and the hour approached when our food used to be brought to us. And each was afraid because of his dream. And I heard below the door of the horrible tower nailed up, at which I looked in the faces of my sons without a, so a word. I did not weep. I saw turned to stone within. They wept. And my little Anselm said, by the way, uh, to understand how there is a, a counter, there is a sort of, of, of movement between the horror of this tragedy and the tenderness, the pathos of it. One of the ways in which Dante suggests this is the use of diminutives for Anselmucho, uh, this little kid that he has, this kid. Thou lookest so, Father, what ails thee? A Dara shed no tears, nor answered all day, nor that night after, till another sun came forth from the world. As soon as a little ray made its way into the doleful prison, and I discerned in four phases of my own look, I bid both hands for grief. And they, thinking I did it from a desire to eat, rose up suddenly and said, Father, it would be far less pain for us if thou eat of us. Thou didst clothe us with this wretched flesh, and thou strip us of it. I calm myself then, not to make them more unhappy, that day and the next we stayed all silent. Ah, how hard earth, what is thou not open? When we had come to the fourth day, God threw himself out, stretched at my feet, saying, My father, why does that now not help me? I don't think it's far-fetched if I were to ask you to overhear behind this question of uh, one of the children exactly an echo of the prayer of Jesus on the cross that we heard a few, that we read a few cantos back. So there is a way in which the violence inflicted on Ugolino's children seems to repeat or reenact the great drama of the Christian sacrifice, right? Because he are now on, uh, also crucified. In fact, there he died, and the star sees me. I saw the three drop one by one during the fifth day and the sixth. Therefore, I gave myself now blind. That's what it is, a lack of perspective. He sees nothing. He therefore has no distance from anything, nor can he tell things apart, to distinguish things one from the other, to groping over each and for two days called on them after they were dead. Then fasting had more power than grief. An extraordinarily ambiguous line because you really do not know what he's saying. According to uh, Rodin, for instance, we go on making a statue of this. It's at the, at the MoMA and you can go and see that. Uh, the story is that of uh, that Ugolino ate his own children. Then fasting had more power than grief. I yielded to the appetites, the urging of, uh, of hunger more than grief. Or maybe he's saying just something else. Maybe he's saying then fasting had more power than grief. I really died of fasting for hunger rather than for the grief. 
We don't know. And I think that part of the tragic mode that Dante is trying to convey to us is that we are left. And this is, by the way, uh, Borges uh, reading. Borges uh, writes nine uh, lectures on Dante. What else? Uh, realizing what the importance of number nine for Dante. He writes nine lectures on Dante. And one of them is on the story of Ugolino. And he says he actually wants us to leave, he wants to leave us in suspension to sus believe that it's possible that he, he may have been eating the children, but maybe because the sensibility of so many critics have been offended by the suggestion that he actually could go on uh, cannibalizing his own children. And, and, and I think that Borges is right, that we are not supposed to be able to tell apart that that ambiguity of that line is never going to be quite uh, resolved. It's going to be forever there. But the most important element of this tragic occurrence. And the Dante, before I go on, let me just say, uh, ah, Pisa, Dante goes on into an apostrophe against Pisa, again with this language of, now he talks, he breaks the silence. Ah, Pisa, shame of the peoples, of the fair land where sounds the sea. Uh, another little touch, of another little echo of the, the vulgar eloquencia. That is to say, in the moment where he's dealing with treachery, which I call the most nihilistic of all sins, because you really declare null and void any bond that you may have with others. He uses, and the, the irony is to me, glaring the affirmative particle, as if here there is any possible affirmation. There is none. Where, the, where sounds the sea, since thy neighbors are slow to punish thee, may Capraia and Gorgona shift and put a bar on Arno's mouth so they drown every soul in thee. This is really the kind of language that Ugolino himself had used when before uh, the consummation of the tragedy he really begs the, the earth, uh, an earthquake, that the earth may open up and swallow all, all of them. Here Dante is using exactly the same language, the idea that so horrifying is the spectacle that he has been, the tragic spectacle he's been witnessing, that the whole world here, there could be an apocalyptic uh, ending to the work. But the, to go back to the the, the, the key issue, there may not be time for a discussion today, and I apologize. Uh, but the, the real tragic event, though, what is the tragic event other than, okay, what if Ugolino had the name of betraying their stronghold, thou shouldst not have put his children to such torment. So this has been the crucifixion of innocence. Their youthful years, thou new Thebes, Pisa is the new Thebes, a new Thebaid we have been witnessing now, made them innocent. Ugutron and Brigate and the other two named already in my song. Uh, this is really the tragic, Dante has been using now the tragic language indeed that he had been hoping and theorizing in the Devulgari Rockets and then they move on. But what is the really tragic occurrence? The tragic occurrence is in the very presence of the Christological language in this camp. Because the, the, the sacrifice of the cross means one thing and one thing only. That now all violence is finished and so because we have found the, the, the scapegoat, the voluntary scapegoat who goes around saying that we're all innocent and that he is the guilty one. That's how we are declared, that's how we are redeemed, that's why we are, we are, we are um, made innocent once again, right? But this story here, reenacting and echoing the story of the cross, seems to say the futility, seems to announce the futility of that sacrifice. Retrospectively says that that sacrifice too was just one of the senseless acts of violence that has happened, that have happened in history, and that punctuate human history. Of course, this is not the end of the poem, but it's the most desperate part of the poem, because Dante comes to believe that the, that the, the law of, 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 of history, that the law of the world is really a tragic law, and there is something absolute about it, and not, and not quite escapable. We shall see how he's going to move through this. And I really have to go into Canto 34, um, so a little bit. I will not say too much this time. Canto 34, where Dante meets Satan. So the encounter with Satan is, first of all, 
that which gives incredible coherence to the whole movement of Inferno, because as you remember, the story of Inferno began with the neutral angels, those who had been sitting, uh, uh, watching the spectacle of the disruption of the cosmos, uh, the neutral angels at the time of the uh, Lucifer's rebellion of, of against God, and now it ends with Lucifer. So it's really it's, it's a kind of angelic, uh, cosmic proportion. The other thing that I have to say is that if you imagine, those of you who are readers of uh, Milton and, and Paradise Lost, if you, and you know how, what a brilliant rhetorician uh, Satan, Lucifer is in, uh, in, in Paradise Lost, you'll be disappointed. Uh, in fact, uh, T.S. Eliot, who writes a comment about this, as I say, he says, I really recommend the first time readers of the Divine Comedy to skip Canto 34 because it's strange that Lucifer, Satan, doesn't speak. And that was exactly the point that I'm sorry to say, T.S. Eliot at this time really had probably had never read the, the Vulgare Eloquenza, didn't read. He's not supposed to speak because he's one of the angels who really do not use the human language, but more importantly, because he represents evil defeated. From this point of view, Canto 34 stands in radical sharp contrast to Canto 33. In Canto 33, we, saw, we have witnessed the sovereignty of evil. It is as if it were all engulfing and hovering over all of reality. Here, now we witness exactly the opposite, how Satan becomes a reified, dumb object and actually an instrument for the pilgrim's ascent. It's going through the body of Lucifer that the pilgrim can go on and the guide and Virgil can turn themselves upside down and finally reemerge to the light. The rest of the canto, good, I think that we're going to have a few minutes, but I have to say something about the rest of the canto. The rest of the canto deals with the, a cosmological argument. And the cosmological argument is, uh, where does purgatory come from? And Dante gives an extraordinary, invents a poetic myth. And the poetic myth that he invents is that when Lucifer fell at the time of the, the grand uh, angelic disruption, Right? the first rebellion against, uh, against the deity, the earth retreats out of fear at the approaching of this, uh, this uh, fallen angel and reemerges on the other side of the hemisphere, the southern hemisphere. That's the beginning of purgatory. But you see the connection from an evil act, the chances of redemption. How, in effect, in Dante's cosmos, there is nothing which cannot be utilized, no evil which cannot be utilized to the ends of the good. Uh, everything, the real defeat of evil is when that itself can become the stepping stone or the threshold of evil itself in order to reach the purgatorial island. The last little detail that I will tell you is I ask you to read the last line of Canto 3. You'll like this. It's a little detail that you'll like, I hope. Uh, uh, the last line of, uh, of, of Inferno, uh, is a quindu scimmo rivedere le stelle, and therefore we came out to see once again the stars. Just a little detail to uh, remind you about the extraordinary s love of symmetry in Dante's poem. Right? That each canticle will end with that same word: stelle, stelle, stars, stars, and stars. That is to say, each canticle ends with us looking up, reminding us of where we are and still longing for the stars. So I can come to uh, a little in a hurry. I have uh, reached the end of the of inferno. Oh, it's purgatory now. And let me see if there are questions. Yes. Yeah, the question is, can I say more, uh, good question. The question is, can I say more about how Dante is trying to construct, how he uses total perspectives, uh, and you mean both in the De Vulgare Eloquenza yeah, and here. 
Uh, yes, thank you. Because in effect, I, I was hoping that someone would ask me this question. Uh, because I really didn't, did not tell you how this, the, the Vulgar Eloquencia is completed here. Uh, and why couldn't Dante complete the Vulgar Eloquencia when he wrote a tract? When he wrote a tract, he wanted to unify, you know, he believed that there are the dialects, 14 dialects in Italian. He acknowledged, he recognizes 14 dialects. He knew some of them very well. And he wanted to make a, a, a unified language out of that, a kind of artificial language, a sort of, let's call it Italian Esperanto, you know, something that you could bring together. And what he was lacking, so much so that there are those scholars who work on, who have been working, I don't agree with that, is that almost Dante seemed to have a kind of, um, seemed to be in agreement with uh, uh, the so-called um, um, uh, uh, logicians, those who have uh, a kind of, uh, the, the, the idea that language has a sort of, uh, let's say Cartesian linguistics, it's a kind of, uh, of rational, uh, rational structure to it, and that can be really remade. The point is that when he writes the Vulgar Eloquentia, this is true. I don't buy the idea that he's following the logicians of the, the, the Middle Ages, the grammarians who are really logicians. What he really lacked was a historical sense. And the little detail that Hebrew was still the surviving language from the creation of man to our own time, because, and he had a good theological argument for that, because it would be inconceivable that the redeemer of the world would use a language other than the language that had been employed by, by Adam. When he comes to paradise, to the divine comedy, he completely changes view. In Paradiso 26, as I'm going to tell you, Dante says, no, no, Hebrew disappeared with, uh, uh, immediately after Adam fell. With the fall of Adam from the garden, there was no longer the primal language. And he goes on elaborating the idea that God does not use any language but the language of, that is to say, human beings are the letters and syllables of God's language. It's not Hebrew, it's not Latin, it's not Greek, it's not whatever. Uh, it's not Chinese, it's, it's, that's really the, uh, we are, the syllables. That's Dante's idea, Paradiso 20, 26. So this was the, that's the, 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 the real change. What, had, what does it mean in terms of the, of the, of the inferno? is that he had understood that in order to write about a unified language, he had to descend. No, he, he could not go on the tower and from there watch all the, the, the qualities, aesthetic, uh, what is the sweet, what is the welcomed language and what is the less welcomed, the harsh language. What are the sounds that he really should be applying and adopt? into Italian, what he really understands that in order to have a unified language, you have to descend into the political realities of, the, of, of these cities. That's, what, that's the difference between the De Vulgare Eloquentia and the Lower Inferno, a sense of history. That's really the difference. And to see this, and the sense of difference, and you can be in a tower as Ugolino is and be blind. Or you can be in a tower like Nimrod is and do not even know what you are talking about you know, who can go on completely reversing, messing up, and confusing the Hebrew that he, he, he should have known. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that's really the difference between the two. Good question, because it allowed me to focus on uh, a detail that I probably didn't explain very, very clear. I don't understand how he would have said that Hebrew died uh, at the fall. You don't understand why? I don't understand how Dante could, could think. Make that statement. Yeah, is that what you're saying he said? Yeah, that that's, uh, uh, I don't think that there are any traces of Adam's language. Uh, the, the, the question is why, uh, it's a sort of uh, predicament, and I don't know if it, uh, he, uh, he says he doesn't quite understand why, how Dante could say that Hebrew died with the fall of man. Yeah. Um, uh, that's what he, Adam will tell him. He, there he meets Adam. There, he's another poet because he's the one who names the world. So where did the scriptures come from in Dante's mind, I guess? But the scriptures are not in Hebrew. Oh, scriptures are, you know, uh, the language of Jesus, for instance, is Aramaic. We have to be careful about what kind of, uh, uh, the, the kind of, uh, uh, is that Adam's language 
or is that a language, it's a language that changes in time, that's all. That's all he's really saying. But the New Testaments are in Aramaic, for instance, which is a dialect. Mm -hmm. huh? Yes? Um, so so this, this goes back a little bit to the, uh, to the last lecture, but um, looking back over the entirety of, of Inferno, it seems like Dante expresses different levels of, of I guess, uh, sympathy or, or pity for the people who are trapped in, in, in certain circles of hell, uh, especially for the, the sowers of discord. And then later, in, in other cases, like at the end of Canto 33, he's happy to be a churl to someone who's um, being, being tormented. Um, oh, yes. Bo uh, Bocca degli Abati. What's up? Yeah, yeah, okay, go on. Right, and um, I, I just, it's, it's interesting, though, the, um, the, rela the different relationship that, um, that Dante has uh, to the different reactions he has to these punishments, given that he's essentially created all of them, that the, the, the Inferno is supposed to be a representation of divine justice, but it seems like overall Dante is the judge and, and executioner here. G given that the whole, how, how sincerely does, does Dante believe in this, in this divide? Does he think he's- In this? In the divide between himself as, as this narrator who can feel pity for the different, for, for the people trapped in different areas of hell versus Dante as, as sort of the, the, I mean, in some sense, he's the creator of all of this. He's Absolutely. He's assigned everyone to each level of hell. I, I know this is a, a broad thing, but I, I, it um, is. I kind of wanted to see some, some comment on, on that divide. How sincerely is this a vision to him? Um, the question is, uh, since Dante's, uh, uh, Dante the Pilgrim um, has different responses to the figures whom he has created. Sometimes he's tender and sympathetic, sometimes he just kicks them. As for instance, that's the scene you were referring to. Uh, and they're all his creations. How sincere is he in his vision? Um, okay, the response is that I, I, I would formulate it a little bit differently, but you know, that, that, that's fine. Yeah, we agree that Dante has, is not the indifferent spectator to all of them. And I think that what matters to him most is to show a degree of passionate involvement with wh whoever they may be. He's not going to be sentimentalizing about all of them uh, for a number of reasons. He's very sentimental with his teacher. Uh, I think he's really very sarcastic with Pierre de Levigne, whom you remember he mocks that language of his, that very, the contrived, uh, I thought, he thought, I thought. That's not Dante's language. That's really Pierre de Levigne's own poetry that Dante is picking up. I think that he is very, with, uh, he, he, he has a sense of pathos, and maybe he's also seduced by Francesca. Francesca, you can't put this pasta that she's trying to seduce him as well as she seduces or lets Paolo seduce, seduce her. When it comes further down, the, the, the relationship is no longer uh, a relationship of, uh, of uh, this tenderness of forms. Now there is really this anger. Anger at what? At the extraordinary horror of what human beings can do. And there's not, nothing. See, Dante calls the fraud, the sin peculiar to man, the human beings. The sin peculiar to human beings because they, are, they have a reason that becomes part of their premeditations, part of their uh, machinations of evil. And I, I find that, uh, that, that uh, 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 repulsion he has, I find that, um, very dramatically speaking, very convincing, very convincing. Uh, it's still part of a judgment that he's making, and it's not an attenuation at all of that, that judgment. The, the anger with which he attacks Pisa, that, that idea that he speaks prophetically there, why is this whole place disappearing? This is, I think that to me is, you, you say it's sincere, I wouldn't be using that language, but I think that it's dramatically very powerful. Uh, and I don't know if you would agree that, that that's probably the best way of referring to this term, to, the, 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 to describe the, this, uh, this situation. Would you agree? Yeah. Um, I, find it, I find it dramatically very apt. It's uh, because it's a consequence of the genuine horror. Can you imagine? I mean, you had the earlier even <clears throat> diviners, 
with the shape, the human shape twisted, the head turned around. Uh, 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 then uh, uh, the alchemists uh, uh, also representing the kind of twisted forms. It's this twisting of the human image uh, and this and the reality of what human beings can do uh, and ongoing and it's this the hatred has taken over. I think that he's approaching them too. There is a, a, a way in which I was saying he echoes U U Ugolino, when Ugolino says, you know, all oh earth wide and there was there an earthquake and which would swallow everything. I mean, the, the, the language of the eater, the cannibal, so to speak. And then Dante just says, on why is there some, some kind of uh, great uh, uh, um, drowning of all this? Why aren't the islands just moving and just and be a barrier so that the whole town will go under? I, I think that there is a way in which he's uh, almost doing the same thing. See, that's it, almost uh, reenacting the kind of uh, sense of nothingness that Ugolino had shown to him. But not, obviously he does not agree with Ugolino. You know, it's not that there is a kind of uh, complete uh, identification with him. And how do we know that this is not going to be the case? He's writing, Ugolino isn't. The poem is what rescues Dante from yielding to the temptation of absolute despair. And therefore distinguishes him, distinguishes his own temporary impulse for nihilism with the nihilism that distinguishes, characterizes all the sinners and above all the treacherous souls. Okay? Uh, maybe we should stop here. Uh, we're going to talk about something so much more serene, purgatory, next time.